Uh, so my name is Kevin Erman Solberg. I'm one of the co-founders of the Mapping Prejudice Project, which is based here uh, at the University of Minnesota. Um, what we're doing, um, in its broadest sense, is we're building the first comprehensive spatial database of racially restrictive covenants uh, for any city in the United States. And I'll talk a lot more about what racial covenants are and, and what that means. But I think it's important for me to, uh, to lead off with an acknowledgement that I'm part of a collaborative effort to do this work. This is certainly not a solitary, a solitary endeavor. We're an interdisciplinary group of historians, geographers, data scientists, librarians, community activists. We've all kind of come together and brought our own sort of unique methodological approaches, our unique epistemologies to kind of tackle this really, really big, this really big question. Um, and I think the uh, kind of the best way to, to get started um, on explaining our work is to start with a story. And it's not my story. It's the story of the Simpson family. Um, and in 1909, W.H. Simpson uh, and his wife Daisy, they purchased a lot over here in Prospect Park. And if you're not from the area, it's actually very close. It's about a half mile, uh, half mile east, um, east from McNamara. And they would be the second black family, the second black family, um, to move into that neighborhood. They were preceded several years earlier by the Jackson family. And when the Jacksons moved in, they did encounter some, uh, they encountered some resistance from their new white neighbors. It wasn't a seamless transition, but within a few years, they were able to kind of you know, build themselves up into that community. It wasn't that contentious. Um, but when the Simpsons moved in, it was a radically, radically different experience. Um, within a few days, they were surrounded by over 100 white neighbors. Uh, the leader of this mob, and it was effectively um, a mob, told the family in no uncertain terms that their new neighbors, their new white neighbors, would take any means necessary, and that's a quote, uh, to secure the Simpsons' removal. And this confrontation, which the Minneapolis Tribune actually called a, a race war, uh, proved to be a pretty profound turning point in the history of the geography, the racial geography of the city of Minneapolis. Um, prior to 1910, Minneapolis, and this may or may not uh, be surprising, Minneapolis was not a particularly segregated city. And this is actually true of most American cities. Through some work through the uh, Minnesota Population Center as well as the NHGIS database, we've been able to reconstruct these historic uh, racial geographies. And pretty much across the board, Deep South, American North, doesn't really matter, cities were less segregated in the 19th century than they were in the 20th and less segregated than they are today. And Minneapolis, Minneapolis is really no exception. Um, Here's a, a quick map that I made uh, using um, uh, census records for, from 1910, Core Plus, showing the uh, per percentage of black residents for each census district in the city. And in 1910, the area with the highest percentage of black residents is near North Minneapolis, and it's only about 12% African American. Um, and in addition, there are actually emerging black communities scattered pretty evenly throughout the city, down uh, the south side of the city by Lake Harriet and Lake Nokomis, sprinkled across uh, along the Mississippi River and sprinkled throughout Northeast Minneapolis. But just 30 years later, this picture looks radically different. Uh, by 1940, there are no black communities south, um, in South Minneapolis. Those communities down by Lake Harry and Lake Nokomis are completely gone. By 1940, there is no census district east of the Mississippi containing multiple black families. And for the first time in the city's history, you start to see the emergence of majority minority neighborhoods. Now, this is a pretty profound kind of spatial realignment that happens in a very compressed window of time. You know, we're only talking about we're only talking about 30 years here, and it's important to point out um, that in Minneapolis, anyway, the black population is staying remarkably consistent through the first half of the 20th century. Um, nationally, this narrative around you know why cities became increasingly segregated is often posited as a reaction to the Great Migration. The kind of common sense story goes something along the lines of, because of racial violence in the American South, a ton of African Americans move into northern cities and they just wind up uh, kind of settling in the same neighborhood. But in Minneapolis in 1910, 0.92% of the city's black. Uh, in 1940, it's, it's 1.5%. So you're talking about an increase of less than a percentage point, right? The black population in Minneapolis is growing in line with the white population and in line with the overall kind of expansion of the city. There is not a huge influx of black residents. So this concentration that you see here, this isn't the result of just a bunch of new people moving to the city and kind of you know, buying houses next to their you know, friends or family who preceded them, right? This is a realignment of existing black families. This is taking an existing fairly integrated city and turning it into a segregated one. And this realignment, um, the Simpsons kind of walked headfirst into this when they bought that house in Prospect Park in 1910. They had no idea of knowing the city was on the cusp of this massive racial reordering, this massive upheaval in terms of where people are and are not living. 
And what we're doing in Mapping Prejudice is trying to figure out exactly how this happened. And what we're interested in is something called the racially restrictive covenant. And I think the best way to introduce a racial covenant is just to show you a few examples. And we found over 30,000 of these, by the way, um, in Minneapolis and Hennepin County. And they say things like this, no persons of any race other than the Aryan race shall use or occupy any building or any lot. Um, this particular restriction is from 1946, after World War II and the Holocaust. Neither shall said property be transferred or leased to a colored person. The said premises shall not at any time be sold, conveyed, leased, or sublet, or occupied by any person or persons who are not full bloods of the so-called Caucasian or white race. Uh, this is just kind of a representative sampling. As I mentioned, we found over 30,000 of these restrictions spread throughout the county, and there's a wide variety of language. But every single one of them makes it very clear that these restrictions are targeting people of color, right? Like, they're not making any bones about this. There's no, this is not racism by proxy, right? These are very explicit, explicit, um, restrictive, restrictive documents. But the thing about racial covenants is that, you know, we know broadly that these exist uh, throughout the country. Uh, the NAACP was founded in part to combat the uh, spreading prevalence of racial covenants in the first half of the 20th century. They were dramatized in plays by Lorraine Hansberry. Langston Hughes wrote about them in his poetry. Um, this isn't exactly like a new, a new thing, but nobody has ever actually mapped these restrictions at the lot level for any city across the country at a comprehensive scale. There's been some representative sampling. There have been a few studies in um, St. Louis um, and Seattle, most notably, where you know, they would f look at a couple deeds for a couple different subdivisions and try to kind of broadly reconstruct what, what, what's going on. But nobody's actually put all of these things together um, in a spatial database, uh, at least until now. This is the primary purpose, if you will, of the Mapping Prejudice Project. We're using a host of different technologies to make this possible, to build this comprehensive database of racial restrictions. And uh, what I want to show now is a time-lapse map I put together um, showing our work so far. So if you look at the top right there, it'll tell you the year. It's a cumulative time-lapse starting um, in 1910. And each one of these blue dots is an individual racial restriction um, that was placed somewhere in Hennepin County. A few things to kind of note about this map. Uh, the first is that it's incomplete. Uh, we are still a work in progress. I've mapped over 20,000 covenants. We've identified over 30,000. Um, we think like the total number of maps will be somewhere in the low, in, in the low 30s. Uh, I'll explain why I have to be a little vague about that uh, later, later in the presentation. Um, we know they started in 1910. That's the earliest restriction we found, and they go well through the, 19, the 1950s. Um, the death of racial covenants was a slow one. There isn't like a hard line where this practice became, um, became illegal. There was a Supreme Court ruling, Shelley v. Kramer, in the late 40s that made them somewhat legally unenforceable. Uh, there was a separate Minnesota law in the mid-50s that made them illegal locally. But it was the Fair Housing Act of 1968 that finally kind of put the death, uh, the, the death nail in um, on, this, on this practice. Um, uh, throughout the uh, th throughout the country, um, but even based on our preliminary work, it's already pretty clear, right? Like the impact that these restrictions are having. You know, like entire entire swaths of the city um, are just being covered by these racial by these racial restrictions. Um, and it's interesting to point out as well that all of this is happening as the black population is under one percent. Right? This is not a reaction to any real change in who is and who is not living um, in the city. This is much more of a pre, uh, preemptive, preventative, um, preventative step. Okay, so, oh yeah, and also too, uh, you know, the other thing about racial covenants, I think it's important to talk about the legal mechanism behind them, so how these things are actually working. Um, and these restrictions are going into property deeds. So the warranty deed, the title to your house, um, in the United States, you can put a restriction in there of really any kind, and this is called a covenant, a racial covenant, obviously, being a restriction that denotes who can and who cannot occupy that property. And the thing with adding a restriction to a warranty deed is it's one of the most powerful sort of legal contracts that's recognized in the United States, because that restriction tracks with the land and not the individual owner. So what that means in practice, if I buy a house in 1910 and I slap one of these covenants on it, right? Ten years later, I sell it to a white person. Ten years after that, they sell it to a white person. Ten years after that, they sell it to a white person. Then that person tries to sell it to somebody who isn't white. Even though I've never met that seller, I can sue them for breach of contract. They've voided the terms of the covenant, and I have legal standing to forcibly reclaim the property, right? 
Like these are incredibly, incredibly powerful tools. Once they're in the property record, they're essentially there forever. And in fact, they're still in the record today. That's how we can find them. Well, the Supreme Court rulings and these federal laws have made them no longer legally enforceable. You can't add a new covenant. They are still in the title record. If you track your deed back, you know, depending on how old the house is, um, you know, several owners, you will find these restrictions in Minneapolis. That's how, you know, that's how we're finding them. And this is true, uh, again, across the country. Minneapolis is certainly um, not exceptional. Uh, not exceptional in this regard. So how are we doing this, right? Um, why hasn't anybody ever done this before? I think are, are fair questions. Plenty of people have tried. It's been interesting in the archival trail. We keep finding these mentions of somebody who in like 1950s, like, you know, I'm, I can't wait to map all these things. And then it's just radio silence from then on out. Uh, <laughs> you know, it never, it never got anywhere. And that has to do kind of with the scope of the issue. So to find a racial covenant, you have to read a warranty deed. Um, for Hennepin County, the county Minneapolis is located in, um, that's about three million, uh, three million pages of historic property records recorded, and that's just the subset between 1900 and 1968, which is what, what we're looking at. Um, most of them, historically, have been on microfiche, and they just haven't been workable. I actually, I did some math. Um, if I spent 40 hours a week just reading property deeds full-time job, it would take me over 20 years to get through the entirety of the Minneapolis property record. Um, and frankly, I don't think I can even read that fast. I think that's uh, overly, overly generous. So what we wound up doing with Mapping Prejudice was trying to figure out how we could incorporate OCR. How could we incorporate these other digital technologies to help us narrow down the scope of the question? And the first step was to get the digitized images from the county. Um, and Hennepin County has actually been very, very accommodating with our project. They transferred the entirety of their records database to us. Oh, we had to sign an MOU with them. There's certain restrictions uh, on what we can do with the deed images, but we are allowed to process using uh, process using OCR. So the kind of rough workflow on that is, you know, you create the OCR uh, translation of each image. You know, I use the Google Tesseract OCR engine. Um, from there, I can write another script that iterates through the text files, looking for instances of racial language. So I have a list of about a hundred words, word stems, different phrases that we have found out kind of suggest the presence of a racial covenant. Uh, the issue is that the deed quality is absolutely terrible. I, I put one up there for you uh, with the covenanted section highlighted, but a lot of them are these pre-lined forms that are typed on top of and often like the line goes straight through the text. So a wholesale kind of translation of this like just isn't practicable. Fortunately, the covenant usually comes in the text block in the middle where they add kind of the unique restrictions to that property, which is fairly, you know, unencumbered. There isn't a lot of like speckle noise going on there. There aren't kind of these um, pre-written form lines going on there. So I can get a pretty good read on that section. Unfortunately, translating the whole document and trusting that is beyond uh, what I'm capable of. Um, if there's any like really good machine learning people out here who got some ideas on that, come find me afterwards because that would be you know, that would be awesome. But so far, we've kind of established a protocol to identify likely candidates. We haven't established a protocol where we can just automate, automate everything. So through this process, you know, I was able to narrow down these, you know, three million deed images into the, you know, about 90,000 images, which is, corresponds to about 30,000 deeds that likely contain uh, racial language. But that's still, you know, an issue, right? I got 30,000 pictures now, that's cool, but how can I turn that into actual mappable, uh, mappable data? And for that, we turn to the online crowdsourcing platform called Zooniverse. Uh, this is a platform I developed here at the University of Minnesota in conjunction with Oxford that essentially the kind of broad theory uh, behind it, I would say, is, you know, how can you use crowdsourcing to handle parts of a workflow that can't be fully automated? So the parts where, you know, you can kind of do some stuff with data before or after, but like there needs to be human eyes and at least some part in that, in that workflow. Um, and how it works is, you know, we just upload the, you know, 30 plus thousand uh, deeds and we have volunteers go through and answer a series of questions about those deeds. So I'm looking for the spatial information, which is the addition name, block number, and lot number. Um, that functions as like the legal address. If like a building address, you know, denotes where a structure is located, the legal address denotes the lines of that, of that property. And I can map that to different, uh, different databases. We're asking uh, what the language of the covenant is. Is there a covenant, yes or no? We do get false positives. Uh, for example, one of the words we're looking for is white. That's usually in the context of a phrase like the white race, and sometimes it's somebody's last name who bought a house in Blaine. Um, and you just don't, uh, you know, you, you don't know ahead of time. You need, you need that to be vetted. Um, each, uh, yeah, step 2.5, data cleaning, which always takes the most time, right? 
Um, each deed has to be looked at by five unique volunteers on Zooniverse. This is how we're kind of handling data accuracy issues, and we're using a variant of uh, Cohen's Kappa uh, coefficient to figure out who's actually good at this. Essentially what that measures is agreement overlap between users who have looked at deeds in common. So you know, if I've looked at 10 deeds, five of those deeds have been looked at by other people, and I'm given a different answer than those other people for each one of those five deeds, you're gonna get a real low Cohen score. We weight that against the log of the total number of classifications. Uh, we're working on the assumption that people get better at this over time, um, not worse, but there's also a limit to how good you're reasonably going to get, right? The difference between your first deed and your 20th deed might be significant, but once you get to deed, you know, 500, 500, and 520, like there's not gonna be an appreciable, a real kind of difference in quality. Um, we query out anything uh, with a reliability score, which is calculated by, again, weighting the log of the number of classifications against Cohen's cap up. So we just get rid of any user who's below a certain threshold. And then whoever's left, we calculate the modal value for each field. So for a given deed, five people look at it, you know, one gets dropped uh, for the field. Is there a covenant, yes or no? Three of those people said yes, one said no. That would return yes. We would say there is a covenant for that deed. If there's a tie, we go with the value of the user who had the highest um, individual rank in that subset. So through this, it's actually, it, it works reasonably well. There's some kind of FUT scene that has to go, go on in the back end, in large part because these deeds aren't standardized. Like we're working with really old historic documents and ye old, you know, um, English uh, that say things like, you know, deed executed on the, you know, year, in the year of our Lord on the 19th date of blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's just weird stuff in there that trips people up. So, you know, we do have some additional kind of like flags where some, if like there's absolutely no agreement for a given deed or something like that, you know, we flag that and then check it out manually. But overall, this has been working, this has been working really well. We're getting good data out of it and it is mappable data, which is um, the last part of our workflow, right? So at the end of all of this, essentially I just have, you know, a massive CSV um, is how Zooniverse exports this stuff. And we do have the legal address which is spatial information, but I still have to be able to track that with something, right? And here it gets kind of tricky because parcels aren't static. And we have a lot of cases where, you know, a house was built in 1940 on a given parcel. Uh, that parcel is then run over by a freeway 20 years later. That parcel will not be reflected in the contemporary parcels database, right? Because it simply, it simply no longer exists. And that's kind of what this is showing over here. Um, the, uh, the blue polygons, that's the contemporary parcel map of Minneapolis. The red polygons underneath, that's what happens when I query out anything where the initial kind of geometry has changed. And thank God, good job Hennepin County for noting when that happens. It makes my life a lot easier. I can actually tell, right, like when uh, the, the bounds, um, the bounds have shifted. But, you know, once we get it kind of, you know, to, to the red polygons, once we get the queried out set, there are still going to be cases where I just can't join that to the stuff that's coming out of Zooniverse because that lot no longer exists. And in those cases, um, we just have to draw them in manually using um, historic plat maps. So similar to the OCR methodology, right? Like I automate as much as I can, but again, when you're dealing with records from the 19, 19 teens, uh, there, are going to be, there are going to be parts where you have to do some stuff, uh, you have to do some stuff manually. So kind of writ largely, that's the methodology, that's how we've been, uh, been approaching this work. And I wanna talk a little bit now about some of our preliminary findings. And again, we are still a work in progress. We have not mapped all of these things yet, although I do have, uh, some good news, we just finished our last uh, transcription on Zooniverse uh, last week, and the total number was around 200,000 with 3,000 plus volunteers who contributed about 14,000 hours worth of labor. So it's been really cool kind of watching this whole thing uh, grow, building this community around it. Um, it's, we learned pretty quickly that this isn't field of dreams. You can't just build it and they will come. Um, <laughs> you know, we've been doing a lot of community presentations. We've really had to kind of embed ourselves in these local organizations, these local communities around the city, kind of like drum up interest in this and to create this, you know, group of people who are committed enough to read, you know, really, really old legal documents from the first half of the 20th century. So it's been really cool seeing that, seeing that all take off. But, you know, we have been doing this long enough and we do have enough data now that we can start to make some kind of preliminary conclusions about, you know, what's going on with racial covenants and also answer the question of, you know, well, why do we even care about these deeds that have been, or these restrictions that have been illegal now for, for 50 years? And I have a few, a few answers to that. Uh, one of the first things that we learned is in Minneapolis, the traditional narrative of kind of neighborhood white resistance doesn't really fit at all. 
Uh, the vast, vast majority of restrictions that we found were put into place preemptively by real estate developers. They're the driving force here. They aren't individual white homeowners who are throwing these restrictions on. It's developers who are buying large swaths of land and racially restricting the whole thing kind of at, at ground zero. And they would actually brag about this. They would play on these you know, racist white fears about property values right in the advertising materials. So for the Delphian Heights addition to Minneapolis, for example, um, you know, one of the bolded sections is new, beautiful, and highly restricted residential sites. And you know what restricted means, right? This entire, uh, this entire division is covered with these racial, racial covenants. Um, other advertisements are actually even more explicit, believe it or not. So this one, uh, down by Lake of the Isles in the Uptown neighborhood, if you're familiar with the Twin Cities, they just print the language of the covenant right in the newspaper ad, right? Property shall not be uh, leased to any person or persons of Chinese, Japanese, Moorish, Turkish, Negro, Mongolian, Semitic, or African blood or descent. Yeah, I know. Nice stuff. And the next paragraph starts, too, with the line, uh, we appeal to those about to marry. Isn't this the best deal that you've ever heard of? You know, I mean, there's this really, really explicit connection being made with kind of spatial desirability and what, quote unquote, constitutes a good neighborhood and this kind of emerging theory of residential racial segregation, which, again, is really taking off here in the first, 20, first half of the 20th century and is in large part being made material by these racial, these racial covenants. Um, we've also learned that racial covenants are highly, highly preventative. Um, and I think the best way to illustrate that is, is this is an aerial photograph taken in 1938 um, in South Minneapolis. And each one of these is a lot that was racially restricted prior to this photograph being taken. So as you can see, land is being reserved exclusively for the use of white people before anybody even lives there. These covenants are predating the construction of new homes. They're predating the extension of the street grid, right? Like you can see where the city blocks are going to be, but they haven't even brought the roads down be um, below 60th yet. Uh, predates utility networks. It predates the extension of the sewer lines. The first, first thing that these real estate developers are doing in the 20th century is restricting land, ensuring that as the city expands, as the suburbs expand, that expansion is reserved exclusively for the use of white people. It is literally against the law for you to own or even occupy one of these lots unless you meet the criteria of the racial covenant in place, right? So it's very much this looking forward theory as opposed to kind of a reaction to an actual influx or you know, changing demographics. This is saying, you know, we're looking 10, 20, 30 years into the future ensuring that kind of the new desirable areas of the city, the new construction, the places where all the new parks and amenities are going, that stuff is going to be reserved for, for white people. The final thing that I want to talk about, too, is the connection and the relationship that we're discovering between racial covenants and more kind of well-known, I would say, discriminatory policies, such as redlining. So this map here um, on the left, that is the, uh, the Hulk redlining map um, of Minneapolis, commissioned in the 1930s. I mean, redlining, if, if, if you're unfamiliar of it, or unfamiliar with it, this is essentially a risk assess a mortgage risk assessment strategy undergirded by racism. So the short version is that the federal government begins commissioning these maps, which break cities down into four categories. Right, green on here is high, as, um, um, oh god, what's the technical term? Green is, blue. Blue is still desir green, green is quote best. Blue is quote still desirable. Yellow is quote definitely declining, and red is quote hazardous. So the way that this works, if you want to buy a house in an area that's been shaded red, you cannot get a federally backed mortgage. And this is a huge, huge deal. If the feds aren't willing to underwrite that mortgage, there's really no bank in the country that's going to do it either. If you want to buy a home in a redlined area, you effectively need cash in hand. There's just no kind of viable way forward to get traditional financing or traditional um, a traditional loan because this area and the house in that area by extension has been considered high risk. It's considered quote unquote hazardous. And we know um, that these redlining maps are based in part on the racial demography of cities. In fact, one part of Minneapolis, that little tiny red stretch that goes, um, that goes south, uh, that was redlined. And in the redlining documents, they explain why each neighborhood got the ranking it did. That one was redlined, and again here I'm quoting, due to a gradual infiltration of Negroes and Asiatics. That's the official federal language as to why that neighborhood is considered risky. Not because the housing structures are bad, not because it's in a bad part of town, not because like the transit situation's bad, none of that. It's simply because people of color have been moving in. It is now considered hazardous. So, and you can also see this um, in the other map. So that's just a dot density map showing where uh, African Americans are living with a uh, redlining districts superimposed on top, and you can see that they adhere to each other pretty much 
one to one. Neighborhoods are redlined for reasons beyond racial demography. So if you look in Northeast, some of that stuff was redlined due to like the presence of heavy industry or a high density of railway networks. But every place where there's a concentration of African Americans gets redlined, right? So things can be redlined for multiple reasons, but if people of color are living there, pretty much 100% chance that the uh, federal government is going to redline that neighborhood. So this creates this really nasty one-two punch in conjunction with racial covenants, right? Because covenants are ensuring that for large parts of the city, and especially like the new parts around the city's perimeter, um, if you want to live there, you have to be white. It's illegal for you to buy a house there unless you're white. Well, what about the housing stock in the city's interior? What about the neighborhoods that don't have racial covenants? Well, these are being redlined by the federal government. If you want to buy a house there, you just need a pile of cash under your mattress because you're not going to get a mortgage from any bank in the country. And when you take these two things together, there simply isn't that much space left over in these cities during this period where people of color can A, legally purchase a given house or a given lot, and B, secure any sort of reasonable financial um, you know, package to make a purchase on that home, right? And in the cases where African American families are able to surmount these obstacles, which are like really big obstacles, right? Um, they're often met with white violence. This is what happened um, when the Simpsons moved into Prospect Park, and this is also what happened uh, when the Lee family uh, moved into a home in South Minneapolis in the 1930s. Uh, Mr. Lee, uh, Arthur Lee, he was a World War I veteran, African-American man, worked at the post office um, in downtown Minneapolis. He was able to buy a home in an area that was on the cusp of a redlined neighborhood, but wasn't redlined, and was slightly north of a covenanted neighborhood, but wasn't covenanted, right? Like he found one of those, uh, one of those spots in that liminal, liminal space. Um, and within a few days of moving in, a crowd of over 3,000 white people surrounded the home, um, trying, to force, trying to force the Lees out. They vandalized the home, they shot at the home, they broke the windows, um, they killed the family's dog. Uh, their daughter, Mary, who was like six, required a police escort just to safely get to and from kindergarten, and this went on for, for, for months. Like it, was, it was really bad. Uh, they probably would have killed the family, that's what happens in most cities when things like this, uh, things like this go down. But uh, Arthur Lee, uh, because he was a World War I vet, he actually called in his army buddies from the war who formed an armed perimeter around the home just to kind of keep this surging white mob at bay. So yeah, it was very, very, very bad. Um, and this is often the experience that African Americans uh, you know, went through when they were able to surmount these like, larger structural obstacles, right? There's always the specter of white violence undergird and everything else that's willing to step in when these more kind of like deliberate or legalistic mechanisms, uh, mechanisms seem to fail. Um, in Chicago, for example, there are dozens of cases of you know, similar um, conflicts when African Americans move into white neighborhoods, and those often do end in, in, in lynchings. Um, again, Minneapolis is a little atypical there in that you know, these didn't end in death here, but obviously the threat of violence and the threat of death was very, um, very prevalent. And we also know that through decades and decades of kind of the intertwining relationships between racial covenants, between redlining, between white violence, you know, this is what made that initial map that I showed at the beginning possible, right? Like, it's not easy to get that many people to, you know, move all into one neighborhood or into certain pockets of the city. I mean, that takes a lot of work. You know, you need things in place to cause that displacement um, to happen. But once those concentrations, um, you know, existed, and once that became common, really, um, in Minneapolis and across the country, this opened the door for a whole suite of new mechanisms enforcing racial inequality. Uh, one of the best known, I think, is how freeways were used and selectively deployed to, A, connect those affluent suburbs, which are covered in racial covenants, to facilitate the flow of white people from the suburbs to their jobs in the city, while routing all of that through African-American neighborhoods. So uh, this map here uh, shows a demographic um, concentration of African Americans in uh, uh, mid-20th mid century with freeway projects superimposed on top. And you can see, uh, you know, similar to the redlining and racial demographic map, right, like there's a very clear correlation here. Where freeways, and we also know this from the planning documents, that freeways are intentionally being run through uh, African American communities. The near north neighborhood of Minneapolis, uh, which hosts the highest uh, black population at this time, is wiped out by the expansion of Olson Memorial and the 94 Cloverleaf. Same thing happens east end of downtown on the Hiawatha Corridor, um, where the new Viking Stadium is now and then also along um, 35W in South Minneapolis. 
Uh, but this map isn't possible, right? Like you can't use freeways as these tools of displacement unless you have existing concentrations of population, right? Like you can't run a freeway intentionally through a predominantly black community unless you've already done that initial groundwork to create a homogenous African-American community. And we know, based on our historical work, that cities have not always been like that, Minneapolis being no exception. This was a very integrated city in the first half of the 20th century. Or not first half, but you know, at the turn of the, uh, turn of the 19th, early 20th century. Right, like those concentrations were enacted through these other policies, things like racial covenants, things like FHA uh, lending policies, things like whole redlining, which allowed these other uh, subsequent mechanisms to, to take root and to have and to have the legal force necessary um, to uh, you know, enact these displacements. And okay, so that's kind of talking about some of the historical stuff, but I also think it's important to draw this line even further into kind of the contemporary uh, racial geography, if you will, of Minneapolis today, right? So Minneapolis has a very liberal progressive reputation. I would say the Atlantic like refuses to stop writing articles about how great it is here, um, which is somebody who's from Minneapolis and always like, hmm. Uh, but we regularly rank at the top of lists that are looking at things like overall educational quality, overall affordability. Uh, we have one of the best park systems in the country. Uh, we're known for you know, having a fairly liberal politics, uh, being tolerant of sexual diversity. Next to New York, we have the highest density of theaters. I mean, there's this real kind of like booster narrative around Minneapolis, sort of talking it up, um, extolling its virtues. But that narrative completely falls apart once you break it down on a racial axis. So I'm going to throw a couple, couple numbers out here. Um, the racial home ownership gap in Minneapolis is 50%. So of the 100 largest metro areas in the country, that's the worst. We're worse than Detroit, we're worse than Chicago, we're worse than St. Louis, Montgomery, uh, you name it. Uh, we have the largest gap. So this is measuring the percentage of black residents who own a home and the percentage of white residents who own a home, right? It's about 25% of uh, black families in Minneapolis own the home that they occupy, while over 70% of white families in Minneapolis own the home that they occupy. And this is massive, right? Like this is the, literally the worst in the country. Um, if you want to look at education, a very similar, um, similar story, the Educational Equality Index, which measures differentiated outcomes between white and black students. Uh, we're 97th out of 100. There's, so I guess there's three cities that are worse than us, um, but right, it, 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 it's not good. The, kind of overall quality of life in Minneapolis and these sort of overall metrics, when you look at the city through that lens, it's, you know, it's not bad, but like once you break it down on racial lines, again, it's, it's one of the worst in the country, and that's no accident. That this 50% gap didn't just kind of you know, manifest itself uh, unilaterally, right? Like that's the result of decades and decades and decades of policies like racial covenants, like redlining, who in, which um, enact these differentiated outcomes through who can and cannot accumulate wealth through home ownership, right? Um, we also know that covenants track uh, very closely with where people live today. Uh, the city average, um, as of the 2010 census, 53% uh, white. Covenanted homes are 80% white, right? So they're 30% whiter than the city average. Again, even though these things have been illegal for, for over 50 years now, they are still informing where people do and do not live in the city. The particular restriction might be illegal now, but the city hasn't reintegrated as a result. Like people just have kind of kind of stayed um, in those pockets once those, once those patterns have emerged. Uh, we also know um, that covenanted homes, they're overperforming the city median by 14%. Um, and I'm actually working with some econ students who are doing the fuzzy regression discontinuity. And that 14% number is the causal relationship between racial covenants and contemporary home value. Right? Like that's not just like, you know, we put two things on top of each other and figured out what the difference is. Like through this, and they, it's, uh, the article's currently under review, but... Um, you know, through their kind of methodology, they were able to eliminate everything else, right? And they found that covenants were, uh, had an explanatory power of about 14% of, of a home's value. So that equates to about 36 grand um, in Minneapolis today. The city median's 260. Uh, redline homes, on the other hand, complete opposite, right? Redline homes are underperforming city median by about $65,000, which is 25%. So if your grandparents were able to buy a covenanted home in 1950, you're doing really good. Right? Like, you know, not only has the, the value of that home appreciated, it's appreciated at a rate far greater than what the city is doing on a whole. Um, if, on the other hand, you were you know, an African American family who bought a home in a neighborhood that was subsequently redlined, significantly underperforming market value. I mean, the, and the difference between the two is almost 100 grand, right? I mean, that's a, huge, that's a huge number, and it informs how wealth is transferred intergenerationally, right? So, again, even though covenants are no longer legal, the effects of covenants, the long term financial ramification covenants of covenants, are still very much true today. And it's also important, I think, to point out, too, that this isn't just a story of racial 
racial divestment or racial displacement. This isn't just a story of you know, bad things that were um, done to the African American community. It's also a story of how white communities were able to enrich themselves through those bad things. Like these were, covenants didn't go in just because. Like they went in because that was a viable strategy to accumulate white wealth at the expense of uh, the wealth creating capacity of African American communities and families in both in Minneapolis and really throughout, throughout the country. So I think all of this begs the question of, you know, as one of our volunteers asked us, you know, so what do we do next, right? Like this is um, not, not, the, uh, not the prettiest picture, right? Um, and what we're doing with Mapping Prejudice is, you know, we're not a policy tank. You know, I don't think any of us are particularly well suited to say what the specific remedies of something like this, um, you know, or, you know, how do you tackle, you know, the legacy of historical injustice that goes back this far and at this scale. But I do think kind of ground zero is we have to blow up this idea that racial segregation was a southern thing and didn't happen in Minneapolis, that it didn't happen in the, in the urban north. And it's true, you know, we didn't have segregated buses or segregated drinking fountains, but we did have a segregated housing policy that has had a huge, huge long-term material impact on the well-being of families um, that is still incredibly, incredibly pronounced today. And frankly, has been more, far more damaging long-term than you know, where you could and could not sit in a bus 60 years ago. Like covenants are the thing that's really informing like material um, wealth disadvantages um, in, these, in these communities of color. And I think from, you know, once we can kind of hopefully you know, acknowledge that, um, that will then um, kind of create or set the stage for the mobilization of political will to actually do something about it. But step one has to be um, you know, really confronting what these policies are, what they did, and the shared responsibility that you know, I believe um, we collectively have to do something about it. So uh, I think that's what I have for a formal, a formal presentation. Uh, I do want to point out that if you're interested um, in learning more about this, you can check out our website, uh, mappingprejudice.org. Pretty much all the maps I just showed you, including that uh, time-lapse one, um, are available there. So you can dig in a little bit deeper if you want to check. If you want to check that out, we're on social media too. We're on Twitter and Facebook. Um, for the Zooniverse stuff, you know, we're always looking for new volunteers to help us uh, build this build this database. But as I mentioned, we're currently done with Hennepin. We're in preliminary talks right now with uh, Ramsey County, which is St. Paul, Mankato, and a few other cities across the country where we're going to try to um, kind of replicate the model that we've developed here in a, in a larger um, in a larger context. So hopefully. Um, if I can get the OCR to work right, uh, we'll have some new deeds up there sometime in the next month or two. So I think with that, um, I'll turn it over, uh, turn it over to you guys and see if there's any questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll start, start with you. And I think someone's got a mic to run around. Is that? Right here. This kind of brings to mind the 1619 project that the Times did a couple weeks ago. But um, one question I had was, are, is anybody using the work that you guys have generated to quantify the kind of wealth um, impact that this has had on the African American and other minority communities? Yeah, so um, that, that econ article that I was talking about, um, we do have, it's, it's um, Aradia Sood and Will Spiegel um, at the U in, in the econ department are doing some of that work. It's a little tricky because our data is not done yet, right? So, like anything that we try to extrapolate out right now is going to be based on an incomplete sampling of where the covenants are. We think it's representative. Um, the way, like, I don't think there's no preemptive spatial information, so it's not like we map everything in this part of the city first and like move on to this other neighborhood. It's kind of a random, it's a random smattering. But as it's incomplete, um, you know, I've kind of put the brakes on that a little bit because I don't want to put numbers out there that. Um, you know, that aren't as uh, precise and defensible uh, as they should be. But that is one of the next steps of this project is once this database is done, and so it will be public, um, we're hoping some other folks kind of pick up the mantle on that and start to, you know, apply some of those more, um, you know, specialized econometric analyses uh, to do exactly what you're saying, right? Like quantify in more material ways exactly what kind of impact this had on the creation of white wealth and the uh, kind of suppression of black wealth. Hi, congratulations on this uh, work. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, the new law in the state that uh, appears to have come out of this project that it will allow people to expunge these from their deeds? And do you think that could steamroll into laws in other states? 
Yeah, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm also super hyped that you heard about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, a, a law was just passed. It was um, introduced by Jim Davney uh, last session, um, was signed about a month ago, which will allow homeowners to file effectively an addendum to their title renouncing the existence or renouncing the covenant. It's a little tricky because technically the only way to remove a covenant is you have to find the legal heir or a sign of the initial granting party and get them to file an addendum, which obviously is just impossible um, at this point. So there's no, because of, again, the way property law works, like the you know, legislature can't pass a law that allows you to kind of like redact stuff, like to actually strike these from the record. But what this law does is it allows you to attach an addendum as the current property owner, kind of denouncing, renouncing, however you want to say it, um, whatever language uh, exists. It's, a, I think, a step forward type piece of legislation. It certainly doesn't solve any of the long-term um, long impacts of racial covenants. It doesn't have that material grounding. Uh, but it does allow for homeowners, and you know, we've. Uh, this was something that kind of came out of a lot of presentations where people are like, look at the map and they're like, oh my God, like I live there, and it says, you know, Jews or whatever can't move here, and they freak out about that, and they want to do something about it. So I think it's a good kind of step forward. It helps raise, raise awareness, and it does address kind of the sense of moral injury that some people have when they realize that. You know, they live in a house that has some really nasty language, uh, language in the deed. So I don't think it's been rolled, like the implementation, I'm not sure if it's been rolled out yet. It's kind of up to each county um, in the state how they want to how they want to implement that. But the idea is it'll be kind of like a boilerplate form. You go to your county recorder's website, you can fill it out. It's like 10 bucks or something, and then that will be uh, automatically added to your, um, uh, to your title. What was the role of cartographers and map makers in this, both at the time and going forward up to, up to now? That's a really good question. Um, one that I probably should have thought of by now, <laughs> being a cartographer and map maker. Uh, no, I, a lot of work has been done on the financial relationships behind these policies. So. For redlining, for example, the way that that worked with Hulk, the Homeowners and Loan Corporation, which was the precursor to the FHA, uh, the Federal Housing Administration, uh, they would commission local investment banks to make these rankings, right? So, like local banks in Minneapolis were responsible for that Minneapolis redlining map, even though like it was commissioned by the federal government. I don't know who the cartographers were um, in these. Uh, Kind of in the creation of these um, these particular these particular documents. I know covenants were never mapped because that's just like that narrative sentence or whatever that goes in a warranty deed. Like there's no kind of spatial database behind it um, or anything like that. I do know there was a guy named Calvin Schmidt uh, who worked in Minneapolis in the 1930s, and he would do things like create these sort of like neutral, quote unquote, descriptive maps that would make this linkage between kind of neighborhood desirability and racial category of that area's occupants like super specific. And that was a cartographic trend, I would say, um, in the first half of the first half of the 20th century, kind of mapping space as like, you know, the good neighborhood, like they'll call like, for, uh, for example, this particular map that I'm thinking of, uh, the Calvin Schmidt map, um, Lowry Hill in Minneapolis is referred to as the Gold Coast. That's the name that's given. That's a predominantly white neighborhood. Um, a neighborhood very close to it, just kind of uh, right on the other side, uh, right on the other side of the street, is called, quote, a Negro slum. Not because it was a particularly poor neighborhood, but just because, you know, this linkage, again, between the racial category of an area's occupants, right, and like the assumed financial condition of that neighborhood is like being kind of intertwined in this new way and cartographers are certainly uh, kind of following that trend along with you know bankers, real estate investors, and really, uh, really everybody else. So I don't know if that really answers, uh, <laughs> answers it a little bit. It's a, it, it, it's a big question. Um, I don't know, something to look more into, I think. And today, uh, well, I guess one thing we could talk, so um, CPED, uh, Center for Planning and Economic Development um, for Minneapolis, who's responsible for long-term zoning and does have a bunch of GIS folks on staff, does have a bunch of cartographers on staff, they've actually been using our data to partially inform how they're approaching zoning long-term. It's the Minnesota 2040 plan, um, which has received some uh, national as well as a lot, of, a lot of local attention, and I'm certainly not in favor or opposed to that. But one of the things that the city planners found out was if you overlay that covenants map on zoning maps, 
it's like almost a one-to-one -one correlation where white neighborhoods with covenants are zoned as single family. Uh, neighborhoods that are redlined, neighborhoods that were predominantly African American are all zoned for high density, which has created this very kind of like uneven pattern of like which neighborhoods get houses and which ones get apartment buildings, which is also correlated very closely with, uh, with property values. I'm not sure if the, uh, you know, I can't speak to whether the cartographers who initially made those zoning maps were like explicitly thinking along those lines, but unintentionally or not, um, you know, those zoning maps that they drew definitely propagated or reinforced or reified these unequal segregative patterns that emerged from explicitly discriminatory policies like covenants or like redlining. Hey, Kevin. Right here. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I just had a question about the redlined um, areas and neighborhoods you talked about. Yeah. Is there like a number as to when a, an area or a neighborhood would be considered hazardous or redlined? It's super subjective. Like there wasn't uh, an explicit kind of quantifiable metric where it's like, okay, we have this statistic, and if you're under a threshold, you get this ranking. If you're over another threshold, you get, you get this ranking. It was left to the discretion of the bankers and kind of property assessors who actually built the map. And um, it's, there, there's, a, there's a cool project called, um, oh god, I'm complete, it's mapping, mapping Segregation. We stole their name for Mapping Prejudice. Don't tell them that. Uh, <laughs> based at Richmond, um, Richmond, Virginia. And they've digitized all the whole redlining maps for every city in the country. And um, if, you go to their, if you go to their website, they've also published the narrative descriptions of each redlining map, which explain you know, why a neighborhood did or did not get, get a certain ranking. And for all of them, they're, just, they're super subjective. Just like, you know, well, this one has a lot of railroad tracks, so we gave it a bad grade. Or this one, the houses seem nice, so we gave it a good grade. Or this one, there's, you know, we saw a lot of people of color, so it's got to be hazardous. Um, and it's, it's also like highly variable, too, where like certain cities will kind of view, or like what constitutes, quote unquote, like a threat to property values or a racial threat is subjective. Um, and this is also true in covenants. Like we know there are covenants um, in California that explicitly and exclusively target uh, Asian immigrants, like Chinese. Uh, in fact, that's where covenants as a practice started in the 1880s. They were later adopted um, in the American South and uh, Midwest and um, uh, East Coast. Um, but like who's a threat changes? We don't see many of those in Minneapolis. Uh, for whatever reason, African Americans, like that's considered the threat. But then you'll see stuff in Milwaukee where you have to be a citizen to live there, or stuff in you know, uh, you know, Los Angeles County that you know, prohibit um, uh, Latinx folks from purchasing property. So it's not like nationwide, this is the metric, this is what we care about. It really speaks more to the particular kind of brand of racial bias in a, given, um, in a given area. And you see that through these descriptions in the, um, in the Hulk maps and in the redlining maps. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. So uh, since you've been data mining and reading all of these deeds, I'm curious if you can speak about covenants more broadly. Are there good or wholesome uses for that legal tool or other surprises people might be finding in their property deeds? Yeah, no, we found some really weird stuff. My, my favorite covenants are the ones that prohibit the use of a property for, um, oh God, what is it, like morally decadent endeavors or something like that. Like, are you, like you can't sell, there's ones that say you can't sell liquor there. No, indecent purposes, that's it. You can't, you're covenanted against uh, using a property for indecent purposes. You know, what that means, uh, I don't know, talk to a lawyer from the 1930s, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Um, so there's uh, covenants before kind of racial covenants really took off, like the earliest restrictions that we found in Minneapolis, so stuff before 1910, they're building covenants. So they say things like you can't put a tar paper shack up here. Um, there's financial covenants, so they say things like the house that you build has to be assessed at um, above a certain metric. So a lot of like uh, Kenwood, for example, which was all built up before racial covenants but does have a lot of building covenants which determined what kind of home that you could buy. So there's some kind of neighborhood restriction by proxy things that you can do. If you just make the buy-in price high enough, like that will create a you know, de facto segregated neighborhood just because of all the other things that kind of combine to produce like you know, racial wealth gaps, right? Um, there's some, some that say like you can't have chickens in the backyard. Um, it's really all over the place. Some of them seem fairly neutral, like uh, you know, the house has to be X feet back from the curb, like setback laws. 
Some are probably, frankly, like almost safety oriented, like you really shouldn't have a roof made out of tar paper, like that's not a stable <laughs> way of building a, building a structure, but others do seem more insidious. Some explicitly racial, some that do kind of other things. Like I mentioned in Milwaukee, I've done some preliminary uh, uh, work over there. There's a bunch that um, uh, require citizenship to purchase the home, which is interesting. We haven't found anything like that here, um, here in Hennepin. So it covers, I would say, kind of covenants like as a legal mechanism in general cover a wide, wide variety of kind of potential restrictions. Some of them are like explicitly racist and hyper problematic, and some of them are, seem fine. We have a question Good. over here. Oh, hi, I wanted to know why um, the segregated neighborhoods accelerated after 1910. Like what were the big factors there? Was it like, yeah, so it kind of, oh. you know, it seemed like Minneapolis was more of an idyllic, um, had an idyllic racial composite or whatever. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think uh, the biggest thing was 1910s, the year the first covenant was put into place, um, and covenants, uh, as you know, I mentioned, like proved to be these really, really powerful tools, kind of enforcing how people can and where people can and cannot live. Um, the National Association of Real Estate Boards, which was founded in the 19-teens, they adopted into their code of ethics a clause that, see if I can remember the quote I'm exactly right. It's, it says something to the effect of a realtor shall not introduce into a neighborhood a character of property or members of any race or nationality that are detrimental to property values. So if you were a realtor, it was against your code of ethics. You could literally be disbarred if you sell a home in a white neighborhood to somebody who isn't, who isn't white. So it's really all of these different things working together. It's also the threat of white violence where a lot of you know, families of color, like they just don't want to risk that. Like they don't want to move into this neighborhood because there's, you know, they know a few years ago the Lees did and you know, they, a lynch mob showed up at their door. So it's a lot of stuff kind of like I would say working together in conjunction with each other to kind of produce this geography. And in terms of like the long term kind of persistence of some of these like segregated patterns of se segregation, right? A lot of that has to do with uh, how the housing market has developed in Minneapolis, where in the 19 teens, 1920s, 1930s, even as late as the 1950s, Every neighborhood in Minneapolis was affordable. Like there weren't neighborhoods that were, you know, you couldn't live there unless you had a million dollars. Like you, if you were a working class family, you could buy a home in South Minneapolis, along Lake Calhoun, Linden Hills, kind of wherever. Um, you know, there were nice homes there, but they weren't like exclusively valuable. Um, that has changed a lot, right? So over time, neighborhoods have become more and more kind of stratified in terms of what the mean housing prices. So during that window of opportunity when you could kind of pick wherever you wanted to live, that's when all these racial kind of tools were in place. Um, once those um, restrictions were removed, that's when you see the financial stratification. We're now like, yeah, you know, anyone can technically live anywhere in the city, but like unless you're super wealthy, you're not going to be able to buy a house in Uptown, right? You're not going to be able to buy one of those homes in, in Linden Hills. Um, are any of the major cities um, in your research, did they reject like the covenants and the redlining or was that just every major city across the board? I haven't seen um, any example of that. I mean, there's certainly, certainly resistance to these things in, from black communities, right? Um, you know, again, uh, the NAACP was explicitly founded to do two things, uh, desegregate schools and get rid of racial covenants. I mean, those were considered the two biggest threats by uh, the founding members to you know, the uh, ex expansion of, of wealth in, in um, African-American and African-American communities. I haven't seen anything from like a municipal kind of established you know, city perspective that made this stuff hard, at least not initially. Um, Again, like Minnesota, for example, we're, I guess, a little bit ahead of the curve in that a state law was passed making these illegal before a federal law was passed. But, you know, this still ran for, you know, the half of a, half of a century before anybody, anybody did anything about it. Uh, the risk assessment stuff, like the redlining maps, I don't recall seeing anything, any resistance from, like, any city or any governmental institution against that, kind of, like, broadly as a practice. There might be some resistance, like, well, that neighborhood should be green instead of blue or something like that, but nobody was really questioning the underlying assumptions that, like, white neighborhoods are, quote, unquote, better and should, and neighborhoods should be racially, you know, racially segregated. That seems to be pretty much, like, the standard, standard best practices, if you will. <laughs> 
Yeah. I'm thinking back to that same map uh, showing the increase in segregation from 1910 to 1940. Yeah, we can go there. And I think that's by census block, you were saying? Oh, which, which one? Uh, yes, that one right there. Or what, what are the boundaries there? What, what are the boundaries for this? Right. Yeah, so these are actually something called the enumeration district, which was an internal spatial unit the census used to compile information but never published at. So the census, it's, it's weird. Uh, so the first time blocks are used in Minneapolis, like where data is published at an aggregated block level for the city, is 1950. So anything before 1950, you either use the city ward, which is the finest grained unit that you can get, which is crap. There's like nine wards in the city. It doesn't tell you anything. Or um, you can use the pop center data, which is like the, the raw returns, the individual returns, because that's all public. Anything before 1950 is public. Um, and in there, there's a field for the enumeration district. And this was essentially like, OK, you know, Joe, the census guy, you're responsible for ED number 200. You got to interview everybody in that, you know, like two block radius. Um, and there are narrative descriptions of what the, bound, the enumeration district boundaries okay. are. Yeah. So my question so is. It, it's weird. It doesn't map exactly to like. Also, my question track. is yeah. I, I see that it's changed, right? Sure. Some, some, some areas or boundaries have been yes. subdivided. And so I'm wondering if there's an effect of maybe the data not being normalized. That's showing this, and then I had another thought that um, whoever is subdividing these districts, I'm, it's making me think of like uh, gerrymandering voting districts that maybe the cause and the effect could be flipped and they're just grouping minorities in one of these new boundaries rather than that just showing a spike in segregation. Yeah, so, so a couple things. Um, you can't really see it on here, but I actually have the raw numbers of the black population superimposed on top, um, precisely because, like, yeah, you know, if you take one square and you split it into four, right, like, that doesn't necessarily mean people move. It could just mean, be like, you know, if you have smaller enumeration units now, which are showing, showing different things. But in, like, down by Lake Harriet, um, you know, 12 just becomes zero. So, like if you add up all the new enumeration districts that collectively would have combined to create the older, larger enumeration districts from 1910, it, zero is still zero. It doesn't so are there percentages of segregation? Or yeah, so the core plus is percentage of segregation. The numbers on top is the total black population per ED. So you kind of have to look, and again, it's like hard to see on this, on this particular map. Um, but you know, in conjunction together, it gives you a pretty good picture, I would say. Uh, we know they're essentially kind of redrawing ED numbers every year to approximate about 1,000 people because that's what one census taker would be responsible for. So what's happening is, um, uh, we'll just keep picking on Lake Harriet. So that, that square in the south, uh, south left that had African Americans in 1910, none in 1940. Um, that gets divided up into four polygons, right? So that means the population quadrupled there. But the black population's not quadrupling. Like even if you look at the raw counts, going in the exact opposite direction, it goes from 12 to zero. Even if you add up all of these new, all of these new units, so it's not perfect. Um, you know, this is an issue of using historic data, right? Like I have this aggregated at like the spatial boundaries used by the compilers, and I can't really get any more, um, any more precise than that. But I'm definitely confident that emerging segregation is happening, concentration is happening. When you look at the raw numbers in conjunction with like the percentage increases or decreases. Um, it's very clear that neighborhoods are neighborhoods are whitening. In terms of like who's responsible for for drawing them, I don't know. Okay, but there there wouldn't be an obvious political motivation for how these are drawn, like a voting district could be gerrymandered. My guess is yes, and the reason that I say that is the ED boundaries are actually tracking with like local election precinct boundaries, so it's not something the census has completely invented themselves. They are using these initial. Um, Initial enumeration units, which are used for a different purpose, right? It's like polling stations, basically. Like if you live in Minneapolis, which polling station do you have to go to? And they, you know, re redistribute those, like as the population shifts. Um, but yeah, whenever you are drawing maps that involve voting, right? Like that's never a neutral, a neutral process. Thank you. Over here. Uh, I am traced uh, how many times you've presented this, who you typically present it to, and other than awareness, how much uh, positive impact you've had. Yeah, so uh, we've presented everywhere from a witch's coven in South Minneapolis. I was on the, uh, the Esri plenary uh, to, at the user conference two years ago. So it's literally all, all, all over the place. We found um, very early on that 
if we were serious about doing any sort of like crowdsourcing work or crowdsourcing component, like we had to get in front of people and we had to get in front of um, a lot of people. So academic conferences, I've presented at a bunch of local libraries, local community groups, um, legal advocacy groups, corporate boardrooms, uh, conferences, uh, conferences like this, uh, classrooms, K-12 as well as uh, college. I think we've done, do you know the count me? I think it's like 200 or something in the last um, in the last two or three two or three years. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and I don't do I don't do all of them. I'm not that much of a masochist. Like this is a team effort for a reason. Um, there's no way I could do I could do all of that uh, do all of that myself. But in terms of like the material impacts that we've had, um, the fact that CPED is redrawing its zoning maps, like I think that's a pretty big deal, right? Um, the state legislation, uh, I think it's a meaningful, it's, it's certainly a meaningful step forward. Um, you know, we're not, again, like I ha we have to draw a line at some point about like, you know, what are, where are we most effective? And for advocating for specific policy changes, I just don't think that's a, for, for a couple reasons, A, because I'm not a policy wonk, and B, I think that in terms of like restorative justice, that conversation should be dominated by the folks who've been living with the legacies of these discriminatory policies for the last 100 years. Like they have a way better idea about what the next step should be um, than me as like a white researcher at the U does. Um, yeah, so I don't know, did that answer, did that answer all of your question, more or less? Okay, <laughs> thank you. I think we have time for one or two more. Or zero more. Oh, there's one. You were saying what uh, other either counties or other cities that you were working with? Uh, what, what were they? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we're in preliminary talks with Ramsey County right now. Um, they've agreed in principle to give us their records, but they have a different, we have to do some different kind of legal rank. Their legal team has different ideas about what should happen uh, than Hennepin did, so we're, I'm not. Our, the University of Minnesota lawyers are having talks with them. <laughs> uh, but that should happen sometime in the next month or two, we think. Uh, Mankato um, is another one in southern Minnesota. We wanted to look at something that wasn't as urban. Um, I think a lot of times people talk about things like racial segregation strictly in like a large city context, which can kind of elide and ignore or, or minimize like the way these racial geographies are also you know, taking place in like smaller, smaller cities or in more, in more rural areas. Um, we've also been in preliminary talks with uh, Milwaukee, Washington DC, St. Louis, what was the other one? Um, Somewhere in South Car uh, Orange County um, in, in, uh, in California to see if whether or not we can get something like this off the ground. There's just like, there's a lot of groundwork that has to happen. It's like A, you have to make sure the deeds are digitized. If it's all on microfilm still, like we can't work with it. Uh, B, we have to make sure that enough of them are typed that OCR is actually like a viable, viable method. Uh, we have to make sure that we can get access to the entirety of these records. A lot of, play a lot of counties, a lot of recorders offices move to the more of this like pay model where it's still a public record. If you show up there, they'll like give you the microfilm role to look at. But if you want access to that nice digital image, you know, you got to pay them five bucks and they'll email it to you. So there's often some concern on behalf of the recorder's office that we're not, you know, unintentionally cutting them out of a profit model that they, that they have. Uh, again, uh, I feel like they're public records, so they should be public. But uh, I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> I don't get the, final, get the final say on that. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. Let's yeah, give him a round of applause. You.